Good evening, my name's Henry Jackman and we're here to talk about various things I've been up to this year which include uh, Predator, Wreck-It Ralph, a little bit of Pokemon and Mosul. Thank you so much for having, uh, having me back here in the studio. <coughs> no, it's a pleasure. So yeah, it's so great to catch up again. Um, so we've done a, we did a video interview like this a, a while ago towards King Kong when King Kong came out, or Kong Skull Island. Um, but just to kind of refresh people, I'd like to revisit kind of your path to becoming a composer. It's a very interesting story. Well, I know you have a very yeah. unique background. And uh, how did uh, you stumble into this profession? So, yeah, that's probably about the right. The funny thing is, on paper, um, it probably would have been... Uh, a, you could see from my musical education that film music might be a good idea. The only person who had never had that thought was me, meaning... I went to St. Paul's Cathedral Choir School, so I was one of those sort of 19th century Victorian looking choristers with an Elizabethan <laughs> ruff and a cassock singing 16th century religious church music in St. Paul's Cathedral, one of the most beautiful cathedrals, you know, in Europe with this very strict mm. classical education. Say, so I went to a, I was a music scholar at Eton College before I was uh, dismissed. <laughs> uh, and uh, similar thing, very, very classical. And so there was, a, there was, you know, obviously film music is really eclectic now, but I mean, yeah. that, that's not a bad grounding, having to know about the history of European Western art music from sort of 1450 to 1960 is not a bad yeah, yeah. grounding. So I guess at that point, I suppose I was sort of being groomed to be a classical musician, straight up, really. Yeah. And then it all went a bit curly when a friend of mine showed up with an 8-bit computer and a sampler and... Um, I just started getting into rave music. It was it was like the end of the eighties, and I was, and I compl I did the classic sort of rebellion. Yeah, didn't want anyone to know I knew anything about classical music. It was <laughs> banging out drum and bass tunes and all the rest of it, and then actually ended up in the record industry. I was lucky enough to work with people like Trevor Horn and all the rest of it. I sort of hid the classical past, and I think the last I was working with Seal in two thousand and one. I think by I mean, my father used to say to me, you know, you'll get, but with all this musical education you got, you're going to get, but not. I was like, oh, Dad, you don't get it. You're just so old-fashioned, you idiot. You know, it's all about drumming. It's all about beats. And da, da, da. <laughs> he said, I promise you, one day you'll get bored. You won't just want to do beats your whole life. And I think I'd finished working with Seal, who's at the sort of higher end of... of um, I don't know why... Sounds like a slight value judgment, but meaning, you know, he, he, it's a sort of sophisticated end of For sure. pop music with, with, you know, interesting arrangements, all the rest of it. But even by then, I was starting to think, working for ages on 10 like three minute tracks that inevitably have intro verse chorus second verse chorus you know yeah. you're never going to use harmony that sounds like Simonovsky. <laughs> that's just not going to happen <laughs> on a, maybe with bjork is the closest you're going to get um so i was getting a bit tetchy i think and my dad's words were starting to ring in my ears of like you're going to get bored you know you think you're too cool for school but you're going to get bored with all this and i and, and i was lucky enough that this um album I'd done called Transfiguration that was my sort of half-baked attempt to do something a bit like Bjork's Vespertine or Homogenic. It had real strings, real choir, lots of electronic. It was a whole right. mix of stuff. And luckily enough, uh, Hans Zimmer heard it and went, well, this is, who did this? It's sort of interesting. <laughs> so I met him <laughs> in his typical sort of provocative way. So why are you messing around the record industry? Complete waste of time. What are you doing in the record industry? <laughs> and in my head, I, I, don't, I this was, I must have been in my early 30s I still stupidly had not made any care in my head film yeah. composer was had sort of white hair and waved batons around and uh, you know it was only a few years since I'd been in Pete Tong's Radio 1 Essential Selection right, right. doing like really cool <laughs> tunes and I've been hiding this classical past and everything and Hans was a genius and just going oh you idiot you should be doing film music you know you've got all of this stuff that needs to come out of the cupboard and uh, and until he said that, it really was a bit of a light bulb. It was, you know, like I say, with the background that um, we've just been talking about, yeah. it would be the most obvious. I mean, I was just about as stupid as you can get, really. I don't know why I hadn't put... But it was, not, it was not on your radar at all? Like No, I think because I'd been hanging out in London working with... I mean, Trevor Horn's like the Hans Zimmer of... Of course. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was all like, what are you talking about? I'm way cooler than that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is about the most stupid thought. I, don't, I, don't, I honestly can't explain why. Because as I started to talk to Hans, it was like my brain started shifting. And then I started thinking, all those hours of me getting annoyed and frustrated, thinking, how do you get Thomas Tallis into a pop record? Or how do you get the harmony of, you know, like 20th century East European? The answer is, you're not going to. 
right? <laughs> yeah. But if you're a film composer, that may be the very thing that needs to happen suddenly, instead of being a curse, instead of being like, yeah. oh, well, I really like German bass, but here's the problem. I also really like 16th century English church music, but I also love Austro-Germanic tone poems. That's a bit of a problem if you're trying to get a coherent tone with a pop artist. That's the opposite of a problem. <laughs> In film music, where you might be doing a film set in 19th century Germany, then you might be doing a film set in like Mosul of 2017, then you might be doing an animation where you need to know all about orchestra, or you might be, God knows what you might be doing. The more tools you've got in your toolkit, suddenly that's a bonus instead mm -hmm. of this frustrating feeling of having been taught about all these different paints, but people only want red, blue, and yellow, so right, you can never right. use the other ones. Yeah. So, I mean, that's basically a bit of an idiot. And also, I mean, it's not as easy as it sounds. Oh, yeah, cool, I'll just do film music yes. then. Right, you know, <laughs> it's different when you're talking to hands, yeah. he can make something happen. Like, well, right. why don't do you want to hang out like a fly on the wall and sort of watch this little... Funnily enough, he goes, I'm doing this little movie coming up. Maybe you could just be a fly on the wall, you know, see, 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 see what it looks like. I said, oh, yeah, what, what little movies is that? Oh, it's a Da Vinci Code with a... <laughs> A small independent yeah. film. <laughs> um, but yeah, his sort of almost deliberate provocation yeah. was really smart. He's a bit of a genius like that. Because uh, we've had a few conversations. It, in, in, even in the early days of just sort of helping out in the tiniest way and sort of learning this, that and the other, with Hans, I'd still have these little attacks of being too cool for school, thinking, oh, I don't know about it, you know. Really? So, yeah, I don't know why, because I, you know, I'd just been doing all sorts of really radical electronic or not every yeah, film needs that of course and uh when i was having one of those moments i think he said something like oh okay well now i get it maybe you're just maybe you're just like a drum and bass guy then <laughs> and it just riled me so much like what are you talking about i was playing like Rachmaninoff when i was 10 I'm a, and he was delivering you know he was just like yeah he was just like you know, exactly poking you yeah. Edging you, yeah. like a good teacher should. But if you're going to have a conversation about what you ought to be doing, it couldn't be any luckier than the, the, the person I was having that conversation. Yeah. It wasn't my like grandfather or a friend of mine right. at the time. Right. It was Hans Zimmer, who, having said you ought to do this, is in a unique position to be able to help. Right, and you, I mean, when you worked with Hans, and you kind of went through the, the same kind of path a lot of other composers went through um, at Remote Control, um, what were some of the things that you took out of that uh, before you started your solo career? Kind of, uh, what were the like lessons you learned to do correctly? What yeah. were the lessons you learned not to do? You know, oh, so many. Funnily enough, not so much in terms of actual musical style. The biggest thing I learned from Hans is something I only understood later. When I very first met him, I was prattling on and you know, blah blah. blah. I talked about all sorts of like history of music, musicology, blah, 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 all, the, all all kinds of different things. And he suddenly goes, oh, well, the thing about film music is it's not really about writing music. Another typical sort of provocative. <laughs> Having had no experience of writing music to picture at that point, I'm not quite sure what to do with that comment, meaning, <laughs> so writing film music has nothing to... And then he went and said, no, what it really is, is telling story. Mm. The primary objective is that you're telling story. It's just you happen to be using music to tell story. Right. But it's that way round. Yeah. So if you have an incredible composer of the quality of Stravinsky, but who has absolutely no interest in understanding what the story is, the narrative and the char characters and what would enhance the experience of the movie and simply writes music, which if anything could be actively harmful <laughs> to the movie, despite being compositionally brilliant, that's a complete waste of time. You're better <laughs> off with someone with average talent who has a phenomenal grasp mm. of narrative. Um, and I didn't quite understand that point because I'd spent all my time in the record industry where it's like music for music's yeah, sake, it's right. not to picture. So I think, that's a bit of an odd comment. And then the more I sort of progressed in there, I was like, God, he was right. I mean, it is the number one... If I were a director, yeah. I would take a reasonably talented person in terms of compositional technique mm -hmm. with an incredible sense of narrative and a, uh, a, a, a specific preoccupation to yeah. help the story versus a complete genius who has no interest <laughs> and is just basically writing music to satisfy himself and then go, oh, well, this will work for this year. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. help at all. Absolutely. So that, that really, I think the number one thing I learned from Hans is that um, film music is an audio version of telling story. Absolutely, yeah. And directors love that because they've already struggled like hell to, to put this thing together. And directors aren't musicians either. So, no, yeah. no, but just even, even getting a cut oh, together yeah, yeah, yeah. that works 
is already, think of the logistics. I remember working with Ed Zwick, he goes, well, what you have to understand about being a film director is it's like entropy. Uh -huh. When you're filming a scene, just for that 42 seconds, you're hoping all the things that need to happen, and the split second you say cut, you know, everything just falls apart. You know, the lighting's wrong, they're in the wrong place, a plane goes over. Right. It's so tough making movies anyway, and trying to control the universe to get what it is that you need and to ex execute your vision. The, the most important thing, like I say, that I was learning from Hans is that directors love it when suddenly this music shows up, which isn't music for music's sake. It also ought to be good in terms of compositional yeah. technique. But suddenly it's adding uh, an extra layer of narrative reinforcement. Like, oh, wow, this scene, you know, supposing a director's like, wow, well, the thing about the scene is I never, I didn't really get that. I mean, it's there. But this scene is so important because it's all about the ultimate betrayal, mm -hmm. you know, and then suddenly the score shows up. And if the composers really understood this scene is all about betrayal. So you've thought about it and you've got a betrayal theme and it has dissonant harmony. Mm. And let's say that this one is the most fulfilled version of that. Dissonant. Be like, oh, my God, I don't know what you've done. But now suddenly this scene feels like the ultimate betrayal. It's like, well, yeah, because we, we, I didn't just write anything. I thought about it. I yeah. realized that it was about betrayal. So then I had to think not about any kind of piece of music, what sort of dissonance would most represent betrayal and how could you lay the pipe for that and how could this scene be like the apotheosis of that um, betrayal? And so, yeah. meaning, that's a good example of what Hans is talking about. Really, the origin of the thought of how to write that piece of music isn't just pure composition, it's like literary criticism. It's mm -hmm. going, why is this scene really important and therefore what is the piece that would most enhance it. And that's when directors love it, because they're, because they're like, this is exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> uh, we've been fiddling with the cut and da da da, and it didn't yeah. have that. Now it suddenly feels like this is the moment when the split in the team is happening. And whatever, yeah. I don't know what you've done with your piece, but now I really feel it. That's what you're trying to do. That's like what you're trying to achieve, you know. Isn't it funny that music does that, though? It's such a weird, if you think about it, just the concept of score, yeah. it's such an odd thing. It's like, because it you're not walking down the street with music playing in the world, it's, but no. it, what, and it's normal, it makes everything, believe, it's the illusion of reality, but it's when see people sit down, no one ever thinks, that's odd, well, there's a big... Well, what's even <laughs> more strange about it, and which is why it seems like magic to a lot of people, is obviously if you're watching a scene, and the dialogue and, mm. and the backstory of the movie makes it obvious that it is, I keep going about this fantasy betrayal scene that I'm using yeah, yeah. as an example, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's self-evidently about betrayal because mm. the conversations, let's say, two people are having is an right. argument about what's gone on and he's accusing her of betraying him, blah, blah, blah. Music doesn't have grammar or words or, or uh, what's the word, like semantics, mm -hmm. but that's actually what makes it even more powerful because imagine if in the background it went, this is a betrayal scene. <laughs> Even though those words are narratively reinforcing, that would obviously be a complete disaster. That's why people try to avoid narration. Right. But if in music you can represent something which everyone just instinctively, and they're not even focusing on it. No. That's the sneaky thing. Yeah. They're busy watching a conversation, but they're hearing something which is making them feel discordant. And that thing, that the, 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 what's really crazy about music is that there are sort of recognizable points. It is possible to write a piece of music which not everyone agrees on interpretation, but if you've got 100 people, 99 of them would say, this music feels like something's off, something's dissonant, something's, you know. Um, but the fact is, it's not, it's an abstract art form. It's yeah. not, and that's, if anything, what makes it more powerful because you can sneak under the bonnet of the scene and make something feel, tilt it one way or the other. And yeah. depending on how you do, you can, you can completely change the scene. You know, it's part of the reason direction meetings are really important because you could watch a scene and go, oh, really? Is that how you... Because I was thinking, mm. really, the most important thing about this is blah, blah, blah. And you could have written a piece of music that actually slightly enhances some other storyline. And that's where a lot of the conversations are. It's like, well, I don't think it should be so... You know, I had a meeting recently. And it's like, look, you've written this sort of lush, beauteous cue, which is definitely... That's one way to look at it. I mean, the other way we could look at it is that this is an antis... I mean, that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And I'd also done an alt version where it's actually, even though everything looks beautiful, it's actually uh, an anticipatory scene where someone is trying to resurrect a character. So you could slightly forget, let the visual effects do the lush stuff. Maybe with the music, what we do is go with my other version, which is more to do with the anticipation of hoping this like resurrection magic is gonna work. And it's two different experiences. If you yeah. play the first cue, you sit there going, wow, look at all the trees and, the, and, it, and it goes with the, yeah. the environment. Or then you play the other cue, you go, wow, isn't that fascinating? It's the same scene. Mm -hmm. But now I'm thinking more about the story and about the fact that he's going into this magic forest for the purpose of resurrecting 
you know, uh, his companion who he thinks is dead. And that feels like a completely different scene. All it is yeah, yeah. is swapping out which, which cue you put in. Absolutely. You know, so that's, that's goes back to the, uh, why are you, what's the purpose of the music? Right. Telling right. stories. Let's talk about working with directors specifically. Mm. Um, what do you like to see from a director? I mean, you've worked with multiple directors, you've built relationships with certain directors, and you're, if you could create a perfect director here <laughs> with the perfect characteristics that would help you do your job, what would that be? Well, in a way, that's a fun, it's a really good question. In a way, I actually wouldn't do that because uh, a bit like the echo chamber of mm. social media where people only get to hear you know, what they're used to, so everyone right. ends up in their own little bubble without being exposed to mm. things that yep. confuse them. Yeah. The great thing about working with different directors is precisely that if as a composer you were asked to draw the perfect characteristics, it would, that isn't what you should do, you know? <laughs> Meaning, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely give you some examples of what's good, but what, what, what the point I'm trying to make is it's actually really good that you start working with a director and if they've got sufficient vision, it's actually, in, some of the rub is what's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise you keep doing the same thing. Oh yeah, sure. Um, but I say the most important thing for a director, not even to do with music, just in general, is the integrity and courage to maintain a consistent vision because mm. it's one thing to sit in a room writing music and you can get knocked off course because there are politics to do with the producer yeah. or the director blah 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 but in the act of writing music you're very often just like on your own in a room so at least when you do the version you want to do mm -hmm. you're not being hit left right and center when you make a movie there's so many you know just the logistics of containing loads of extras and actors and actors with big egos and schedules and thunderstorms and financial crises and god knows what else <laughs> and then on top of that the studios show up and they're not they don't like the director's cut and they want to you know the marketing want to make sure that blah 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 and then and, and nintendo are happy with this that and the other there are so many uh incoming missiles yeah that to deal with all of those in a in a sort of politically acceptable way but hold on to the, the, the vision and know when to pick a fight and when to hold on to something critical because it's not going to be the movie you want to make is the most important thing. In other yeah. words, that the, it, I, I, there's very few jobs where, where the initial, I mean, you could sit there in post-production and have this wonderful fantasy about how it's all going to go and then it actually starts happening. <laughs> and that's a very different thing. And if you can hold on to the vision of something right. and then shoot it and then execute it and then put it together in an edit and it's actually there, mm -hmm. um, I would say, this. but that's like a big picture thing for a director. In terms of music, I don't, I'm not really that interested in directors being like super musically educated and specific. I much prefer, it's really just tied to what we just said. Right. I love it if you play music and because, and they react like instinctively and strongly, not even necessarily the musical language, because mm. they have a coherent vision. And if you have a co coherent vision, you'll be able to go, oh, this is fantastic, I like this. And then, oh, one thing in that piece, I think we've got to be careful about such and such because mm. they just have, instant instinct I can see what you've done there and I yeah. know you're making it very sacred but I don't think I think it's ahead of the story I don't think we should let on yet that and those reactions should it with a good director just be fairly instant and quite visceral mm -hmm. and it's the same with anything whether it's a costume design or like special effects whatever it is and every time a director is able to be instructive like that it's because of the coherence of what they see right. so if they hear something or you present them with anything from visual effects to going through different takes because everything they're assessing is in relation, if they're a good director, yeah. of something that they know they're looking for, then you can keep, you have an internal reaction that's coherent. When you don't have that vision, it's a disaster. Yeah. Because one minute it's like, oh yeah, shouldn't this be like really heroic? Well, I wrote that one, remember, and you said it should, oh yeah, no, maybe it shouldn't be. Well, maybe it should be, maybe, it, I don't know, is it too early to be, yeah, I, I, uh, 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 and just, that's a disaster. <laughs> then you just do millions of versions of everything. And then you probably lose your focus too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that, 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 that coherence that's inside you exactly. gets you inherited from the director. It's like the captain of a ship. If you've yeah. got a captain ship and they're running a tight ship, everyone knows what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as everyone thinks the captain has no clue, everyone from the navigator to the cook, mm -hmm. the food starts going bad. Right. One minute you're heading northwest, then he's changed his mind. We're going like southeast. <laughs> it's like, well, hang on. Like, <laughs> do we even know where this ship's going? Right. You know? <laughs> And, and it, you know, you're always going to get a couple of those kind of projects. But I've been really, I mean, the sort of directors I work with, you know, that's... Yeah, you've had yeah, a lucky really streak lucky. there. Yeah, yeah. But that, that, you know, not, it's not all like that. So, 
Um, that's probably one of the most important qualities. As to being specifically really musically educated and being able to articulate, whenever a director starts a sentence, look, I don't know exactly how to say this. Mm. I always go, well, A, don't worry about it, and B, yes, you do, because I bet you what's about to come out of your mouth, which I much prefer to be in, like, narrative. It's my job to translate it. Yeah, It'll be job. a narrative point. Right. And it's never true. You know, whenever people, uh, good directors prep, it's like, I mean, I, I don't know specifically. It's like, don't even worry about that. <laughs> Just say the thing. And inevitably, when you work with people of the quality of the Russos, you know, they'll just say something and yeah. it'll be a narrative point. And then I'll come up with a musical proposition, either verbally, then I'll go, I know exactly, okay, no, I get it. I, I get the point you're making and therefore this will now be reflected in the next iteration of the music. Um, so yeah, let's jump into some projects, some mm. recent projects. I know la we did a quick phone interview uh, when Jumanji came out, but I do want to revisit Jumanji because oh, I yeah. thought it was great. Yeah, um, was I thought it was such fun. an amazing surprise. Everyone was not expecting it to be as great as it was. Um, I think for that film, which you, you've had some experience in the past, but juggling kind of extreme action, like really exciting action, but also it's a, it's a comedy. It's an mm. ensemble comedy. Did that throw you any curveballs on how to uh. match, get the tone correctly? Um, when you're juggling action and comedy, or is action comedy pretty straightforward? No, I, I, it's funny. Once you start doing loads of other movies, you have to start trying to remember it. <laughs> but you know what really helped? Talking of directors, what really helped was Jake. Jake's really good. Yeah. Because he's a writer talking about right. the vision. Yeah. Not only he's, he wrote, you know, he's a writer and director, and he's got comedy background and chops. So no doubt there were, I mean, the key thing with comedy is always timing. But he was so good. No doubt he gave a bunch of notes, all of which really helped shape a lot of those things. Yeah. But tonally, I don't think so because it's if you were trying to mix some quite dark harmonic symphonic tone like Kong Skull Island and lots of comedy, it'd be a little more tricky because the harmonic language would be more dissonant and then you've got to kind of mm. pull out of that. Whereas Jumanji, it, it did have some dissonant harmony and whatnot for, for, the, um, for the evil one. But the sort of heritage of that score being an action event, the reason I was so excited to do it is there aren't many... Yeah. You know all those movies that, if you're into film music, of a symphonic kind, yeah. that one loves, like, you know, uh, E.T., Raise the Lost Ark, Temple mm. of Doom. There aren't, the, the tone of those movies, when people go, oh, why don't people write music? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you need a movie to be like that. You need right. a movie where the, the, the tones change. The, the days of, like, Indy hanging off a, a truck, hitting Nazis, and it feels sort of semi-fun and comedic. That's not how, like, imagine the Chris Nolan version of that, right? <laughs> it's not going to go, yum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. it's just, we live in different times, yes, right? Yes, yes. But Jumanji, as a, a tone, as an idea even, was inherently part of that family action adventure. Mm. I suppose, you're right, you know, the Jurassic World, you know, the, the continuation of that. Right. Franchise is another example yes. of, but that, you know, they, they're, they're not loads of them. No, no. <clears throat> So I was really excited, you know, and James Horner ha captured that spirit in the... Oh, the original was amazing, yeah. 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 And so I, I, was, I was really looking forward to doing a straight-up symphonic action adventure film, because there aren't many of them, and really enjoy... Instead of being told, oh, deconstruct the theme, we'll have less theme, and it was the opposite. <laughs> you know, let's have, a, you know, there's yeah. a whole loads of Jumanji thing I'm looking forward to using if there's another one. I don't know if there is. Because I just spent ages writing good old fashioned like themes <laughs> on manuscript paper, you know. I think with eight hundred million and or, yeah, it would, you'd be probably slightly be, mad. Yeah. Not to. Um, but but the point being, from a, a symphonic language mm. that comes out of this, a sort of Sylvester Horner, John Williams type heritage, the flip to having to be comedic for a bit and then get back to action adventure is not as tough as being in the middle of, uh, you know, Dark Knight Rises goes to comedy and yeah. back to dark. You know. That's true, because you look back at Back to the Future and all these, and they have yeah. those moments. They have, yes. and Sylvester and Williams are able to, I mean, Indy has so many of yeah. those. Uh, loads of them. Yeah, yeah. Right. And there's something about that symphonic style uh, and, and the, that, that kind of orchestration and harmony and all the rest of it, where it's, it's a bit like an animated film. It, the turn yeah. is not outrageous right. to get to get there. If you're in the middle of Blade Runner and suddenly someone's going, well, what about all the jokes? Can't we have like some fun? Well, how are you going to get from, <laughs> from one to the next? You know, that, that would be, I mean, in that case, you, yeah, well, you just come out. Just don't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, this year, let's talk about uh, The Predator, which um, was the follow, you know, Shane Black's, mm. uh, which I know didn't do critically very well, but I enjoyed it a lot. I, yeah. I, you know, I love the original Predator. I even like parts of Predator 2, even though it's insane. Yeah. 
Well, I'm obsessed by pre- it. Was this whole thing? I, I hardly have any fanboy moment. Weirdly. Right, and I know your story with yes. with Silvestri. In t- weirdly, yeah. with music, just I guess because I do music for a living. Yeah, I'm gonna have a fanboy moment if I met I don't know Madeleine Albright or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm quite into pop. You know, that would be like, wow, it's Madeleine Albright. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I'm unlikely to feel that about. Um, you know, uh, so even someone as talented as Pharrell or whatever, because we're in the same industry. Right, yeah. The exception to the fanboy thing for me is Predator, because, I mean, I won't waffle on you. We've already, I'm we've sure talked, we've done, We've yeah. talked that story, exactly. but for anyone who hasn't heard it really quickly, Henry was really inspired uh, yes. by finding a VHS tape in boarding school. Yeah. They snuck it, they watched it, and he loved it. <laughs> right, exactly. And it's the first time to film music, seriously. So when, uh, and normally, I've actually, ironically enough, Done a few scores where Alan's done the first one. Yeah, Captain America. Ca- Captain America. Um, I'm sure there was another one. Anyway, yeah. the point being, or oh, X Men First Class, it wasn't Alan, but it's more another case of like you're doing one where there have been several before. Right, right. And anytime there's a suggestion, hey, should we use things before? We're like, oh, screw yeah, that. Fuck let's, it. Yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> you let's, can let's, say fuck right, it. Exactly. Um, the only time that wasn't the case is it was the other way round when I was talking to John Davis. I could see he was sort of hedging a bit near, like, I wonder if it might be worth... Because, and I was like, let, right. let me stop you right there. It is mission critical <laughs> that we get Alan's D and I don't know if we know what kind of permission we need. I'm talking... Right. I, I don't mean, like, go and get the score and take... I'm talking about we need at least one or two themes mm. that we can play with, because I'm obsessed by octatonic harmony, and it, it, he's, it's covered in it. Yeah. And it's literally going to be a geeking out exercise... <laughs> For me, and I'm going to get on the blower to Alan, and the whole thing's just going to be awesome. So instead of like tiptoeing around, ooh, could we use a bit of the original? I absolutely insist mm. that we do. Not only that, it's going it, to, it, I'm going to give you like cue sheet nightmares because I want to take Alan's DNA and, and I'll write octatonic things as well, and we can start morphing it, you know, <laughs> into this massive sort of tribute yeah. to the harmonic inspiration that, because it's very, people may not realize, I mean, if and anyone who's properly interested in the sort of uh, the technique and the compositional technique it really should get much more if i had my awards thing predator should get an award because it is seriously original and i was talking to john powell about this the only concert music i can find that has a similar use of harmony is Rims- some passages in Rim- rimsky korsakov mm. and the polish composer Simonovsky. wow and the funny thing is because alan is so humble I, when i'd finished the school i was we were just chatting on the phone yeah and i was like how did you arrive particularly given that it's not an art film the original predator you arrived at this really highbrow um octatonic harmonic language that's seriously dissonant but you may you also somehow made it a bit cool <coughs> sounding like what on earth it's really original i can't think of any john williams or alex north or any precedent for something being that harmonically dangerous and exciting, but still being like I said, it doesn't feel like some pretentious exercise yeah, not in at all. copying. But if you got your pen out and had to do like a full harmonic analysis, it's really interesting. And it set me thinking. Yeah, I know you talk about yeah, that's right. what like, triggered your brain. So, but when I was on the phone, I don't know if he was just being like extra humble. He's like, oh, I can't, to be honest, I, mean, like, I felt like I was, I felt like I wasn't even a film composer. I, it, I remember at that point in my career, I just felt I was floundering. And I remember thinking, if that's your version of floundering, then you, you are just a ludicrous instinctive genius. He probably got there via jazz, is the truth, in terms yeah. of that harmonic, because there is a bit of a crossover in the dissonance of jazz, which obviously sounds very different when you have a ride cymbal, upright bass, piano and sax. But if you strip that away and just look at the harmony, there is a bit of a crossover between dissonant concert music harmony and jazz. There's a weird... So he, yeah. with his background, he probably got there. Anyway, so all of this I was exploring in the, in that, uh, in that score, and just got. That must have been like a playground for you. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Did you chase that movie, or did they come to you? Um, no, I didn't actually. I can't quite remember what happened. I feel like you probably would have told your agent and be like, "Get me that movie." No, <laughs> wait, why? I was. My problem is I'm always so busy. I never know what's going on around me. Yeah. But all I remember is the minute I got a whiff of like, "Are you interested?" I was like, "Let me explain how interested." <laughs> I am. Well, do you need to know? No, I need to know no details of any kind. <laughs> because for me, it's a weird fanboy, you know, I mean, as it turned out, it was Shane Black, who's oh, yeah. hilarious and witty and Amazing. talented and blah, Such blah, blah. Such a great writer right. and director, yeah. So I got lucky. But if you told me it was my grandmother who was doing it, I'd go, I'm still interested. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we can, you know, keep all that weird dissonant harmony. So when you approach this one, obviously you, um, you know, honored Silvestri's music. Mm-hmm. When you are dealing with something that has that kind of, uh, you know, 
uh, presence and everyone, it's iconic. Everyone knows Predator. What do you hope to bring from yourself into that score? Well, two things really. Firstly, how do you put yourself aside? I don't know. <laughs> um, well, you do anyway. If, if you're, really, I, you have to do that anyway. If, yeah. if you're doing a, a, a score and you're really serving the movie, you have got to leave yourself at the door anyway. Of course, yeah. Um, but, but, I think two things really. One, some of the Allen DNA only covered like a bit of the film. You needed a lot of other DNA yeah. for the new Predator and for the sort of dirty dozen theme for the crazy loonies. And yeah. I needed a new overall Predator theme. But what was fun about that was making them octatonic so they could share. You know, I had situations where there's like a sort of Alan Viola line that's contrapuntal to like, you know, it's all happening at once kind of thing. Um, but then also there were certain sort of remixy elements like there's a da 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 And I thought, well, that he, he's nailed that. But I really want to bring that back. So if you bring it back, you know, you've got to do something with it. Right. And because the character Traeger was pretty badass, it's like, well, it's sort of asking for a bit of crunch and a bit of distortion. Mm. And people forget, the great thing about Alan is he's cool. Uh, because he's a bit older now, you forget that. But if you listen to Predator, not everyone was using a Lynn drum machine and in the context of 1980. Yeah. So I was saying I should do the 2018 version of clearly just getting a Lynn drum and copying what Alan did in 1987. It misses the point. The point of why Alan was cool. And there's a lot of composers who, who just right for symphony orchestra would never think hey why don't we get like a lin drum machine and, and put down a <laughs> you know a groove and then do the orchestra too so there's some fairly crunchy remixy versions of a few things you know um but uh it was really what what i really enjoyed about it from a sort of intellectual standpoint was the integration of it mm. meaning instead of like sometimes when someone goes let's quote a certain previous franchise thing. Yeah. There's a score, and then suddenly, like one piece just sticks yeah. out as being this is literally we're just like, re recording 3M4, yeah. 3M26 from yeah. the other one, and then score resumes with this like thing that stuck out. Yeah. And my, my miss on this one is like, no, 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 don't do that. That's a terrible idea. Just make sure that, that keep the Predator harmonic framework, which is what I've been obsessed by since I was 14 it was anyway. Very, it was woven very well. Yeah, so yeah. you should, so anyone who's not a real geek about it wouldn't really know that under the bonnet there are various threads from previous versions because it's all in the same, yeah. uh, not all in the same fabric, but uh, the, the danger sounding Predator material is, is all octatonic. Absolutely. And I, it, it, the end result was great. I mean, congr I mean, Oh, Bravo, so sir. It was just really fun and, and just thanks for delivering that to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so jumping to Ralph Breaks the Internet, which sees you kind of entering back into the world of Wreck-It Ralph, and, um, which I love the first one and the second one was fantastic as well. Yeah. Um, this is not your first sequel, of course, um, but when you enter... Well, hold on. Is it, it your first sequel of I your think, own thing? Yes. Of your own music? I think it's the first time... I'm doing the movie after the last one and I did the previous. I think it is. Oh, no, Captain America 2 and 3. Right. That doesn't quite count because yeah, I didn't do one. didn't do one. It's the first time like, there's one. Unfiltered, purely Henry yes. Jackman music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and it's more difficult than you think. Oh, Kingsman. Kingsman. Yeah. Right, yeah. But that was with Matt. So that's, Matt. Not, yeah, so that's, that's kind yeah. of your old, just in your head. Yes. Um, so yeah, do you have like a secret recipe to tackling a sequel? Is there... Yes, don't make the mistake of thinking. I remember talking to Laura. I was like, oh, I've only just finished Predator. And I was... Uh, Oh, don't worry. You've done, I mean, surely it won't be quite as hard because you've already got a Wreck-It Ralph theme and you've already got a... So, and that is true. There is a, you know, yeah. some established DNA. But if any part of you thinks that, oh, well, this will just be a bit easy, it just isn't. It's probably harder it's to... It's harder. I remember talking to Vaughan about this. Yeah. Matthew on, on Kingsman 2. You know, Matthew's between producing and directing. He's been involved in a lot of films. And I remember when they're working through some of the structural issues, as you inevitably do in any creative process, he's like, you know what? I honestly think, he, he goes, I, I was thinking that Kingsman 2, because the first one worked out great and everything. Yeah. I was thinking it'd probably be one of the easier films. He's like, if anything, it's the most difficult. Yeah. You know, and he's right. Um, you need because it. apart from that initial, you know, they start off in their old world mm -hmm. and there's a sort of reworking of a cue from the first movie. It's not long before they get propelled to the internet. Yeah. <clears throat> 2M13, I believe. After which, it's a whole, all bets are off, whole new world, different use of electronica, the 8-bit thing's out the window. Yeah. They're fish out of water in a bigger, more grown-up world. All sorts of new themes are needed. You know, have fun with the princesses, have fun with being able to quote Star Wars. <laughs> um, but the... Uh, and Vanellope grows up. So, so it really was sort of just 
like doing a new movie. Yeah, once you <laughs> kind of get out, yeah, when you get into that new world. Yeah. And, but it's I always love listening to how composers tackle that, especially like with John and and the How to Train Your Dragon franchise mm. and how he's evolved that. I can't wait for the third one. Um, but going back to that theme for Ralph, which I really loved, where was that theme born from? Because it, it's not just a simple theme. It has a kind of a I don't know, it's, it feels like a person, you know, it feels like a, a character walking. Yeah. It has like a whole backstory to it almost. I don't know. Um, it, it, how, well, I also modified it for the, the original. Dun, 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 was one of the things. But then, then there was also the. Dim, 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 yeah, dim, that's dim, yeah, that. Dim, 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 dim. But that also has. Dun, 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 yeah. Which is derived from the. Um, that I, that's a good question. I think like what I, inspires that, like, when, or how do you because it, it ca- encapsulates it so well. So, it's a really good question. I think I actually I remember standing outside a dentist's waiting to, to, <laughs> I can't, I'm pretty sure I was standing outside when I came with the dun 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 dun, dun. but as for the dun dun, dun 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 dun, I think I was working to picture and just sort of felt a tempo. I was like, we need. To, in order to not be pompous for this world, it, we, there has to be a poppy hook to it. Yeah, I guess that's what it is. Ding, it is ding, a poppy ding, hook. Because yeah. you need the root movements in the left hand to go, oh, I get it. This is quite. If you just sat there going, ging, 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 I don't think that's going to go anywhere. Right. Yeah. You said, well, hold on. You need to get a few <laughs> things going. Um, and that shows up all over the, the, the second one. Yes. And is used actually quite emotionally. Some of those cues at the end. Beautiful. Yeah. Are instead of. Because originally. It got quite a few hooky, poppy kind of uses in the first film and a little bit of uh, more symphonic use. But actually, it ended up being used quite a lot in an emotional, symphonic context. Yes. And there are other things were needed, like because they sort of break apart, I, f- I had to come up with this like slightly more dissonant fracture theme. Mm. Then there was an internet theme that was a mutation of the plodding because they're sort of inadvertently sucked into this new world. In the first movie, when he's sort of plodding along in his brick heap, it goes boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and when they go to the internet, it goes dun, 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 da, 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 So the first three notes are the same, but instead of his old plodding life, yeah. it has this slightly more um, adventurous harmony and, and the trajectory of the melody yeah. goes upwards. But the director's one is that, oh, I love the way, I, I, I recognize it because the first three notes of this internet idea come from the Wreck It, Wreck it Ralph theme. Yeah, that's from the first movie. Right, wow. So let's talk, I mean, kind of an overall approach. When you're working on a film, of course, the bigger the film, the more kind of uh, cooks in the kitchen there are, the more likely there is to be picture changes. Of course, every film is going to have picture yeah. changes. As a composer, um, you know, I've, I've talked to composers who, like, there's new picture changes every 24 hours. I yeah. mean, how do you keep your f- score from kind of collapsing on, <laughs> on it itself? Because, you know, if they, they take five frames over here and then ten frames yeah. here, and then everything you had set up is, zoop, like, you know, shifts and it, it doesn't yeah, work Yeah, it's very anymore. disappointing. When, when things are super <clears throat> picture-specific, like in animation, yeah. it's incredibly frustrating. Right, then uh, because then you have to conform it, yeah, everything. It's really important. If it's, like, Dark Knight or something, yeah. you know, these arcs are a lot longer, and a beat here and a beat there doesn't change uh, a long trajectory. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's two things, really. One... I mean, of course you know it's coming. Is there a way to even prepare for it? No, not really. No. Not really. And here's the, the thing you shouldn't get too worried about is, yes, it's true in the detail, mm. but ultimately it, it's very rare that a minute is added or a minute is lost. Me, the, you, you, if you've nailed it, you have the correct piece of music for the scene. Right. And then it becomes annoying that the scene has slightly changed. Right. Um, one of the things you can do to mitigate things is don't chase your tail. I'll very often write a piece that wo- and, and it's approved and it works for the scene. You go, oh, there's a new version. Oh, is there? Whatever, don't care. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's a new version. Oh, there's a new version. Just skip the nine iterations. Go, when are, when are we flying to London? <laughs> 19th of January. Okay, so let's, I'll conform to that Conform one. it. We'll pick a cut two weeks before right. that. And I, I'm just, and then you miss out all this. Uh, oh, well, after the preview, we put back the joke and then we took the joke back out and we said, oh, did you? Well, I'm not even, <laughs> I don't even care because I've good... missed out all of that. Um, short of like the purpose of a scene, supposing they got a note to do with this scene's wrong and it should be more, okay, that's right, different. Right, right. Then now it's a new concept. But if it's not a new concept and, and the director really likes the cue, don't spend all your time not writing yeah. the remainder of the score <laughs> doing 11 conforms of that. Because half the time, the, the version that comes after the version that comes after the version is them going back because actually it turned out that the, the new joke that the producer thought was funnier wasn't any funnier and they've got, <laughs> there wasn't any more funny and they've gone back. 
Yeah, the other I, th- one. I think John told me, John Powell, he told me that sometimes he'll design cues to be able to, he knows it's going to get shortened, so he he, he designed to, at a different tempo, and then he just like changes the tempo and it yeah. still works. Yeah. Or something I, like that. I don't know if, that, if I'm remembering yeah. correctly, if that makes sense uh, technically on a technical level, but... <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I, 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 yeah. Well, he's a very clever chap. I'm sure. I'm sure he's got a number of tricks like that. But um, yeah, you should. You shouldn't panic if if not all the cues are to the latest cut. You've got to figure out when you got to record it. Right. And have a good music editor who keeps you posted, so he can tell you radical things like, "Ooh, you should have a look at you know such and such a cue. It's completely changed. They've swapped the scenes. Okay, that's different." Yeah. But when it's nips and tucks, what's the point of worrying about seventeen rounds of nips and tucks? And then guess what? I bet you after you've recorded, there's some of that happening anyway, which the music editor has to deal with. So don't be a technician chasing your tail. Make sure, because the most important thing is the quality of the narrative in your music Mm. and spend as much attention on that as humanly possible and then spend the necessary attention getting the other technical stuff right. Otherwise you've got, oh, well, I've written half the score and it's, it's working perfectly to picture. I uh, didn't actually spend that much time on the orchestration because I was mostly w- uh, trying to do the 17 versus <laughs> what a yeah, waste yeah. of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about video games for a bit because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a gamer and I'm a huge proponent of... I feel like video games don't get their due credit in our industry. They're kind of seen as... They're for, they're for kids, you know, yeah. a little bit. In the game community, no, they're taken very seriously. But if you... I, I, I wrote an article for... Well, the, the production sp- value has also got so much high. I think oh, some of yeah, that yeah. is the heritage. We've all been listening to whatever the best technology and the biggest budgets and orchestras and da 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 right and what, what whatever is available the highest resources mm. has has been what we're used to hearing f- for movies since like the 1930s yeah whereas of course video games the heritage has been like a chip that can make white noise on one channel and then two other noises and there's yeah. a legacy of that of course that started changing in the 90s yeah. so actually we can fit on the cd rom a bit of music and cut to now where really there's no... No limits. Well, there's, there's no difference in the production value. There, there are limits on the composition because of the nature of playing a game versus watching a fixed right. experience. And in fact, that's a really interesting thing, especially on Uncharted. Yeah. They were pioneering some of this sort of almost AI technology where if you have the stems and certain tempos, it starts to make game-based intelligent decisions about which stems... You know, go. So how do yeah? I mean, you, when you're writing to a picture, when you put something, you stick it there, it stays there. But when you give something, yeah, it to doesn't the, work like that. You with have video no games. idea because that's it, yeah. it shapes it. You don't know yes. exactly how it shapes. No, right? which is why ultimately I still prefer music uh, for movies, mm. uh, for that reason. Right. But it's still really exciting because it's just a very different thing. But you have to be a little more modular mm. in the way you think. You can't suddenly do a turn, or you can't have a. Um, specific climax i mean you can in terms of uh, this piece is definitely the heroic piece but the gameplay is such that you need the technological flexibility that you can't you know you have to be quite thoughtful about tempos relating to each yeah. other and keys yeah and not in a way that means you can have loads of them the opposite <laughs> ones where many more things work but Uncharted is a little bit different because it's a little bit more linear. It's a that's linear, true versus like Just Cause or something, which is a sandbox open world. That's true. That problem... And there, there, there were quite a lot of set piece. You know, yeah. Uncharted. There was there was quite a lot of Uncharted that felt like yeah, straight those, up those story. cut scenes were yeah. pretty like a film. And those yeah. guys didn't mess around. It was you know proper budget, proper use of orchestra, proper time to mix. You know, and also you get longer. Yeah. The other thing, it, it's a slightly more incremental. It depends what you like. The thing about movies is that oh my god. We gotta get this thing done. You know, there's these huge red lines. Yeah. Uh, whereas video games, it's more of the slow burn of like, mm-hmm. well, yeah, maybe let's get another 25 minutes into the game, and it, it's not quite so. I mean, there are deadlines that when you need to record the orchestra. And How stuff. long is that whole process? Is it kind of like on and off, where it's like, hey, yeah. hey, Henry, we need music exactly. now. Yeah. Like, one of the reasons I just thought it's just never gonna happen. I'm just way too busy, mm-hmm. but I'd really like to, especially I'm charters. I'm like a massive uh, yeah. franchise was when I sat down and spoke to them and said, look, what we're not expecting is for you to stop doing... Everything else. <laughs> yeah, it's not like you're going to stop you doing... You have to drop your life but, for yes, like a couple of years. But here's the good news. The way we work and the way this game comes together, the, the fact that it can be incre- you know, incremental and in gaps between things, that actually is how we work anyway. So yeah. I was like, well, maybe it's... Because I didn't want to sort of disappoint them and say, oh, this is something I could do, and then at some point go... Hey guys, I'm really sorry. I just can't see this happening. Um, it was incremental and, and over a, a long period of time, you know, and you sort of learn things. It, it, I don't know. It, it, it's sort of like a massively time-stretched version yeah. 
of doing a movie because the sort of the the process of feedback and integrating it into early versions of the game and what yeah and especially with some of the more technical things about tempos and keys and which stems work which you, you get this really cool there's there's more of a sort of experimental especially with them in uncharted they were really on the cusp with some of this new software that they had that they wanted to try out where it made sort of ai decisions on analyzing stems and which stems could go with other ones not in a completely preordained more like a matrix yeah that tries to understand the music and select what isn't that terrifying though to you as a composer <laughs> well no not really because it's really to do with the smartness of the set you you wouldn't be able to it necessarily reduces compositional mm. scope because you couldn't give it the stems for Strauss's like I'm Heldenleben right. because it's just like what am I going to do that is <laughs> it's, it's it's a standalone piece of symphonic genius so it so but then you get into it for different reasons you know that would be like saying oh well Brian Eno's rubbish because it's nowhere near as harmonically complex as as Stravinsky it's like well what a ridiculous comment yes it's yeah. genius for completely different reasons <laughs> yes. that would be like accusing Stravinsky of not being cool because it doesn't sound like ambient music it's <laughs> like well of course it doesn't you idiot <laughs> you know it's, it's brilliant for other reasons <laughs> um, so the process of it is is uh, just a very different because it's it's but it still has some of those film music aspects. If you were, if the if the director's good, as well as these sort of modular concerns yeah. about how it works with gameplay, you still end up having those conversations about what is this character and what what does this character mean and how should we feel overall in the same way that you would have conversations with a director for a movie. Yeah, and, and Nathan Drake is such a, I mean, he's, he's right. a character. He, yeah. It's not a game where I feel like Just Cause, you kind of, the player puts himself into that character. Yes, himself, that's a really good point, that actually. More. Nathan Drake, you feel like you're, wa you're watching a performance. Yes. I mean, you really are. And that's partly that director. He's, yeah, he's Neil, got, Neil Druckmann, yeah. Yeah, he's got, like, form for, for, for sort of scenes that take your breath away. I mean, you end up getting moved, uh, um, The Last of Us, Oh my God! Yeah, I mean that was kind of shocking. In the oh wow, I, this is this, this isn't a video game. Was I, one of the, I'm having a moment. Yeah, here. <laughs> the, the, the end of that is yeah, just kill people. Oh my God! And it, it, the, the way it, it, I know it was so uh, just intellectually complex too. It wasn't it? Yeah. those characters and and the way and Gustavo that, scored it. Oh, it, yeah. oh it's, it was fantastic. And I um because <laughs> it's funny. This is how dedicated he is to video games. And it was obviously the most stupid thing for me to say, as if <laughs> as if. Video games are somehow, you know, every now and then I, I'd just be talking to him and watching some of these things. I'd be like, dude, you need to direct a movie. As if that was... That was like, well, see, it's like, that's the thing, though. No, but because a part of me still thinks like that it's a would... a superior... Well, right? I don't know about superior. It's like this level of narrative. I'd just love to see what would happen. Yeah, you sure. Know? And uh, he would always smile. And like, But his, his, his dedication and his passion for yeah. video games was so... He was so rooted in that. But well, I didn't mean that like I was denigrating video games. Right. I really just meant, given that some interesting choices are made with directors who don't necessarily do a great job, <laughs> every, you know, I, no, I, I, I would put would, yeah. money yeah. on, on sure, you never know because things are logistically crazy and you know, there's a number of reasons why things can go wrong. But he, he has such vision. The thing I was talking about, yeah. he has a vision and yeah. it gets executed. Um, obviously, it's a little easier with programming and not with crowds of people. And yeah, where every little decision is controlled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything, right. Every but the, there is a really good example of someone who had a vision that wasn't like anyone else's, and and you already saw it in The Last of Us. Yeah, he he executed that vision such that when you see, go, I have never seen this before. Whatever yeah. this is, I don't know who came up with this, and right. the answer is, it's him, and it's his vision. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so just taking a look at kind of genres, you know, specific genres, is there any genres that speak to you more as, as a storyteller? Do you like drama over comedy or, or horror? Have you ever even done a, have you done no. a straight horror? I don't think no, you've done I don't. straight horror. Well, that, <laughs> one doesn't want to be snobby because there are some, you know, classic, like The Omen and The Exorcist yeah. stand in a league of classy 1970s highbrow. Mm -hmm. Without being rude, horror tends to be four guys chip sure. in with 400 grand each and get two HD cameras and go and hire eight people you've never heard of and see if they can make $80 million having only put in 400 grand. Right, yeah, it's, it's about <laughs> there, budget. That's really yeah. unfair because anyone who's a fan of horror will go, you ignorant idiot, and <laughs> quite rightly list, you know, five to 10 incredibly yeah. creative, really well put together 
and brilliant horror films. Of course, that's true. But as a composer, it's a little more schlocky. You're likely to the closest things like The Village. Yeah, a, sli a yeah. slightly more interest to film composer because not only is there like a, a scary element, there's a broader poetic narrative that turns. Sure. I mean, people haven't seen The Village. Oh dear, I'm about to ruin it. You're fine. The point. The point <laughs> being, you know, that there's this whole idealistic community that tried to you know and there's the twist that it's not yeah, actually it's an old society and blah. so there's all these layers so so as a film composer in terms of I mean, james james newton had did such a good job with that mm -hmm. it's not like so it needs to be scary and then this cue needs to be scary and then it's too scary and then don't forget to do like a big shock there and then it's scary and then we need more scary music is that okay that's sort of more like a really um well-constructed wallpaper yeah whereas if it's something like um the village or I, i'm trying to think of another example of something that whilst being scary still has more broader narrative elements. That's just going to be a bit fruitier yeah. fr from the point of view of composing because you've right, got right. more more to play with. But not really. I mean, um, I'm very excited about working with... I've just finished this movie, Mosul, because, I mean, you know, it sounds like the most ridiculous thing to complain about. I love doing all these big movies, but necessarily the, that kind of... Um, because I'm able to write for orchestra and also do electronic music. Yeah. And it's a real privilege. People ask you, look, would you like to do Jumanji? Who's the last one did Jumanji? James Horner. And now they're asking me, you know, when I was 14, if you told me <laughs> that James Horner's going to do the first one and you're going to, I'd just laugh in your face. Yeah, you know? yeah. So it's all a huge privilege, but I'm very interested, but don't often get all the time in the world yeah. to do, um, you know, less, for want of the word, big movies and the, some of these things I'm going to do with the Russos I'm really looking forward to for that reason and I, by the way that sounds wrong like somehow the these other movies aren't going to be big but you know what I mean like the, the yeah. tentpole, tentpole but the and the Russos have budget. nailed all those but yeah, they've yeah. set up this other company mm -hmm. and with a focus on a more kind of you know for want of a better reference Sicario type yeah type films as opposed to you know those guys are genius they can do all and any of the above they're doing yeah. the biggest movies in the world with those Avengers films right you know, but they also have a real passion for a lot of like independent 1970s type movies and they, you know, like opening up a channel. Yeah. Which you even saw in like Winter Soldier had that kind of... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. What yeah. I love about... This is why I hate the idea of oh, a commercial movie. It's such nonsense because people who are really talented like the Russos, you can mm. tick all boxes. Yeah. Yeah. You can make something that's universal, entertaining, scary and has political and artistic credibility. Right. It's really difficult to do it's all hard. of it. Yeah. Hardly anyone has all of it, you know, like... Yeah. big successful makes loads of money critically approved and actually has has somehow got like political substance into a superhero movie yeah yeah but that's why they're genius absolutely <laughs> um <clears throat> so kind of looking back your first solo credit was monsters versus aliens yes which is an animated film your most recent film that you just completed is uh ralph breaks the internet another animated film and in that span of of time do you see yourself have, having changed as a composer, as a storyteller? Do you still see yourself as the same kind of the same voice as earlier? Or do you, do you think you've I evolved? don't know. I think so other people should make that. I think I might have got slightly better at getting to where I need to get to more quickly. Uh -huh. I feel like I might have got slightly better. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's hard to analyze yourself. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, I feel like, if, you know, I mean, Alan Silvestri's version of him feeling like he was floundering and wasn't a film composer <laughs> apparently was Predator, which to me sounds like a masterful execution yeah, yeah. of an idea. I mean, I probably felt like that. It's not like, I, I mean, I knew a lot about music, but in all honesty, if I try and remember back to Monsters vs. Aliens, I think it was a pretty good score, but I bet you I felt like I was floundering mm. just because it was the first, um, maybe not by the time I was recording it, but I think the internal process of, okay, none of this music exists, I need to make it, and the sort of psychological barrier or, or sort of or, or I don't know what the word would be the the challenge of it feeling somewhat overwhelming since none yeah, of it was it daunting at all being your yes first yeah one? daunting that's yeah. the word I'm looking for and I think because I've done quite a lot of films you just get used I guess it's like saying to a, a news anchor hey do you get nervous yeah, yeah. Like, well obviously I don't not get nervous at all otherwise it probably wouldn't be good because I'm like re I'm the news anchor <laughs> yeah. I read the news it can't be like me chilling in a chair and hanging out with my friends. But no, it's not, I don't get sort of paralyzingly nervous because, you know, I've been reading the news for six years. Or yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bit like that, meaning you, it's, it's a process where 
I think I enjoy more all the stages of the process. Instead of thinking, God, I really better come up with some great things for this thing. And the first thought being, well, I'm not going to relax until I have written them and the directors really like them. So, well, don't jump there straight away. Just enjoy yeah. the process of it. Enjoy. They'll come. It'll be fine. Don't <laughs> worry. Whereas I think the first few projects you do, you just can't wait for that moment where everything's settled and everyone loves the sound of it. And, yeah. you know, and they approve, and blah, blah, blah. Whereas I think now I do enjoy the process of like, well, who knows? what yeah. it's going to be right. <laughs> and don't there's no need to panic you shouldn't know what it's going to be yet you know see see that's where part it, of the fun. Part yeah of the exactly it's difficult to feel like that in the first few projects because sure. you, you know it's just you're a bit green um i, I don't know i mean it's, it, for me from my point of view it's been great to that's what that's why i fell in love with film music in the first place when you find a voice and and when i felt i fell in love with hans and harry and john yeah. like when i was nine and watching that sound evolve through film and then the directors they work with and you and for at least for the film goer and the movie goer it's 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 so to see you grow not to be right. all sentimental and everything <laughs> so like, well so. no i was no, very grateful to be talking about it but yeah, yeah. i'm not it, it's something that you'd i think you'd be better off at figuring out <laughs> what it is that, than i would in right a way. yeah because from the point of view of being a composer it's less about looking at yourself in how you might have developed and because you're so focused on each project yeah and the project is the thing driving what something needs to be yeah so i don't know if it's set in like 16th century france and it's about the huguenots or something you're so thinking about france and the huguenots and uh, and so you enter this level of commitment like you've had 17 consecutive wives <laughs> <laughs> and if someone says well what do you think about all your wives you're like oh god i don't know <laughs> they each because I, I, at the time i believed each marriage was like the most important thing ever and then each one ended and then i launched into the next one so you i promise you, you'd almost be <laughs> better off thinking about it i think i'd have to stop doing it yeah, for yeah, a bit yeah go, in like, order. go back and yeah do you, do you look do you ever listen to your old stuff do you ever uh, go back or if it's on if a movie you've scored is on TV, i generally do you watch get it? a bit uptight if I, li I the most the most amount of times i listen to stuff is when I'm, i guess you have to be slightly careful with directors with this because <laughs> you don't want that feeling of like i basically scored this scene before because <laughs> let's all be honest we've all seen that scene where the character transforms from <laughs> yeah. yeah there's only so many and and okay it, Often I'll, for want of something, say, well, okay, this cue isn't quite right. Well, what is it? Is it, is it that it needs to be like reverential? Is it we're missing the, hey, uh, Pete, grab the, the temple cue from Kong because that's the sort of reverential slow. Sling that in for a sec just as a test, like psychology yeah. of music, just because I know that cue and go, oh, interesting. Yes. Uh, oh, it's too dark, obviously, because it's from Kong. Yeah. But there's a clue here because this is starting to work and the reason it's starting to work is it's because it's a re reverential wow. piece or... Um, yeah, it's because I can remember certain things that I'll often use them as a quick reference to do like, well, I always call it music psychology test. If it's like, well, everyone's confused about the scene. It's all right. Well, let's talk about it. Yeah. What's important about the scene? Is it that we're trying to, is it that it's always gone wrong because it's too leading and it starts to feel too dark? And I'll be like, well, get, grab uh, Pete, grab, um, sling that in. Yeah. So no, you see, that doesn't work because right. Okay. We learned something. Mm -hmm. That's too dark. What about if it were da, 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 da. And it's because I've written so much stuff that there's about a handful of pieces I can sort of remember yeah. that could be useful, you know, in, in terms of um, a reference. But generally, I love, one of the things I love listening to other people's music when, when it's brilliant is you can relax. <laughs> and you don't have any of the history and the baggage of the minutiae of its construction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, imagine if you were an engineer. You know how when we get on a plane or a train, you just get on a plane, you sit on a seat. It's yeah. not like you go, well, it. interestingly, this is the Airbus 380. And imagine if you knew <laughs> everything about how, because you were in charge of the design of right. the Airbus 380. You'd think of all the baggage in your head instead of just being a person relaxing, sitting in a seat. The thing I love about listening to, especially concert music, you know, like real composers, not us lot, <laughs> is A, it's brilliant. And B, you didn't have to do anything. <laughs> You didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to go through iterations. You didn't have to do the orchestration. You didn't have to record it. You didn't have to. You just sit there and go, "This is all brilliant, and it's all happening in real time." Yeah. And I don't. Whereas if if you hear something that you've done yourself, that, that I always have a slight weariness of like, "Oh God, <laughs> maybe something else." But it is useful, I think, when you um, if you remember your music well enough, it's useful actually, just in a practical way, to sling in to do music mm. psychology tests. Right. To go like, it's not going to sound like this piece. We just need to figure out what the issue is here. Should yeah, it yeah. feel, you know, neutral? Should it feel, should it feel, and, you, and just like, well, grab the 
such and such cue from there was a like, reminiscence cue in Cap 2. Sling that in a sec to see if like mm. having a reminiscent type feel is going to yeah. help the scene, you know. Wow. So looking at what you have coming uh, forward uh, in 2019, you have uh, Detective Pikachu, which yes. is looks amazing yeah. and it looks like a lot of fun. Um, you're scoring a film called Io? Yeah, that's done. That's done. Yes. And then, uh, I guess you were mentioning the, the Russo brothers. Have, yes, so, so which Daka. I think I shouldn't talk. I can't quite remember. I'm allowed okay. to say, but I don't want to talk too much about it. Yeah, those. well, Daka is on IMDb. Yeah, okay, has, great. Yeah, so it's, right. it's out there yeah. that they're uh, working on that. So you, you do have a full slate coming up. So yeah. um, anything you can tell us? <laughs> well, no, yeah, I, I'm sure. I don't know. How's the only, Pikachu going? The only reason I'm nervous about that is I remember once making a remark. I never thought that being a film composer would be important enough to anyone to play some silly games, but... I remember doing an interview once with someone and it, funny enough, it was about Wreck-It Ralph 2 and uh, I just made the remark, I wasn't saying at the time, this is not long after the first one, yeah, yeah. I wasn't saying, hey, I know there's a second one. It was an abstract conversation where I was like, well, I guess I've never done a sequel where I've done the first one, but I guess if you were to do the second film having done the first one, uh, it'd be an interesting experience, one I've never had, you know, I suppose the one advantage was you can keep some of the DNA mm. from the first one. That turned into a phone call three days later going, a uh, bit of a problem. <laughs> and I got sent a few links like, film composer Henry Jackman announces Wreck-It Ralph 2. It's like, that is, I did not announce Wreck-It. I did Wreck no such thing. <laughs> yeah, so annoying. <laughs> oh, I had to smooth things over with Disney. It's like, I promise it. Well, A, I've learned something. About yeah, that, being you careful. learn yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and B, I can assure you, that's not what I said. But anyway, um, the Pikachu movie, yeah, it's great. And it's got what I like about it is it's got everything that is expected to be delivered given the huge nature of the franchise and yeah. indeed the international voices and pressure yeah. <laughs> on making sure certain um, Pokemon and Pikachu related right. things are exactly as they should be in the same way that if Kevin Feige invites you into the Marvel Universe right. yeah. <laughs> clearly you've got your own directorial voice, but you're not going to go, right, let's turn this into a porn film. It's like, well, <laughs> look, you know, you're just going to get fired. It's a Marvel film, you know. I mean, um, so <laughs> Rob Letterman's hit those boxes, but he's also got a, a cool... You know how Who Framed Roger Rabbit you can yeah. enjoy if you're 10? Yeah. But actually has like a noir adult element to it so that adults can enjoy it. And there's a whole load of things that you may not realise as a yeah. kid to do with Toontown as a metaphor for like a boutique America... And that whole speech from um, the evil character that Christopher the Lloyd judge, played. Yeah. Yes, and he's like, I have a vision of freeways, yeah. which of course didn't exist at that time, and franchised outlets. And they're like, what the hell is he doing? And I'm going to run through Toontown. And yeah. the, the, which was all about the car companies buying up all the, you know, there's all this layer of political it's and social lot, yeah. stuff. From it. But you don't have to, if, if you're 10 years old, who cares about that? Because it's also hilarious and entertaining and yeah yeah you know seeing the live action there's a i can't give too much away about pokemon but there's an element of that that there's also because, yeah. yeah rob letterman's found a way to get an artistic angle at the same time mm. as and it's nothing like roger i'm just using roger rabbit as an example, example yeah, yeah. of something that has more than one layer and i think that's what he's achieved um, but I just wanted to thank you. I mean, thank you. I'm looking forward to 2019, and uh, thank you so much for making time at the end of the year right now to chat. Oh, and, it's been awesome. And uh, we'll, we'll do it again, and uh, you know, whatever the. It's amazing you say it was two years ago. It doesn't feel like it, it feels like a shorter space of time. You know. Yeah, we did Kong, the Kong. Time flies. Interview. Well, we did a phone interview, I think, with Jumanji. That's right. That's why yeah. it doesn't seem like two. Years. Yeah. So we. Yeah. So, but uh, thanks so much for your time tonight. Yeah, no problem. And, thank you. Uh, Good luck for 2019. Have I'm a sure happy new great. year and happy holidays. <laughs> awesome. All right, cheers. Let me give you a little...